Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, Salam alaikum, Ramadan Kareem, Kulam, want to tell you. Greetings to everyone and uh, happy welcome. Ramadan and blessings to all. A warm welcome to all of you who have joined us today for this virtual academic program on national security strategy development and implementation in Africa. A special thanks and appreciation to those who attended round one and round two and now with us in round three. My name is Luca Byung Denkwal. I am the academic dean at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies and the faculty lead of this program on national security strategy development and implementation in Africa. And I will be moderating this session. I would like to begin our program by a brief, by brief remarks by Ms. Kate Knopf, the director of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Since you have her bio, I need not to introduce her again or her bio, but only to mention that she has served as the director of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies since 2014. And indeed, she provides invaluable leadership guidance to all our academic programs, including these national security strategy development and implementation in Africa. Uh, Ms. Kate, you are welcome. Well, thank you, Dr. Luca, and uh, welcome to all our participants uh, once again. Uh, the Africa Center, as you all know, serves as a forum for research, academic programs, and the exchange of ideas with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening the effectiveness and accountability of African institutions. Uh, our mission, just to recall, is to advance African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. The Africa Center's mission revolves around the generation and dissemination of knowledge through our three organizational pillars, our academic programs, such as we're doing now virtually, our research, uh, and our engagement with our alumni. Uh, and we're glad to, to be back with all of you. We you know, seek to generate relevant insights and analysis that informs practitioners and policymakers on topical and emerging security trends and on effective responses to, to dynamic and complex security challenges. And recognizing that addressing serious challenges can only come about through candid and thoughtful exchanges, the Africa Center provides opportunities for uh, us all as partners to exchange views on shared interests and sound practices. And then these relationships uh, we hope are maintained through our community chapters, uh, which uh, we look forward to introducing each of you to, our communities of interest, our follow-on programs, uh, and uh, when we can travel again, our bilateral interaction, uh, as well as ongoing dialogue between participants, faculty, and staff. This dialogue infused with real world analysis and experiences you know, provides an opportunity for continued learning and catalyzes concrete actions. The mission that we have is guided by our vision you know, to advance the security for all Africans championed by effective institutions accountable to their citizens. And this vision, you know, we believe, encompasses the official goal of the African Union to end organized armed violence on the continent. And it connects it to the United States fundamental tenets of democratically governed civilian led security sector institutions capable of delivering safety and security for all citizens. Accountability to citizens is an important element of our vision as it reinforces the point that in order to be effective, security institutions must not just be strong, but also be responsive to and protective of the rights of citizens. So by engaging with all our African partners, military and civilian, governmental and civil society, as well as national and regional, we hope to reinforce that we all have valuable roles to play in mitigating the complex drivers of conflict and insecurity uh, on the continent today through enduring and capable institutions. So we hope that you'll stay connected uh, with us uh, uh, throughout and beyond uh, this program on national security strategy development 
Uh, we have a LinkedIn uh, uh, alumni page, uh, as you see here on the slide, uh, that we will invite you to. Uh, please uh, um, check out uh, the resources on our website, including the daily media review. And most importantly, keep us up to date uh, uh, on uh, where you're at and uh, uh, what's going on uh, as we continue to try and offer uh, webinars and programs uh, for professional development for all of our alumni. Now, all of this information is available on the website on the programs page uh, in all four languages uh, of the program. You know, so you can find the slides there you know, in French, Portuguese, and Arabic as well. Thank you, Dr. Luca, back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Kate, for your remarks and for your leadership for these programs. Uh, before I turn to our panelists, let me highlight some few ground rules. Now, let me just uh, uh, introduce you to the, the real objective of our, this round. This round three of the National Security Strategy Development Process is the last phase of the national security strategy development. In, in fact, is the seventh phase and the last phase. And this round, it focuses on national security strategy implementation, the process and mechanism. And it is divided into the following three sessions. The first session, that is the session of today, will focus on the national security strategy implementation and its relationship to the sectorial security strategies. Session two will focus on the national security strategy, allocation of resources and leveraging partnerships. Session three will focus on the national security strategy, civilian oversight, monitoring and periodic review. And we hope that you'll be able to attend all these three sessions, including the sessions of today. But before I could, I, I start to the to the, uh, turn to the panelists. I just want, for the sake of those who, for all of us, some just to share with you some of the key takeaways from round one that focuses on the national, on the rationale, and key concept of the national security strategy, and round two on the national security strategy development process. One of the biggest questions we raised in the two rounds, is there a need for national security strategy in Africa? Indeed, security like any other public services such as education and health need a strategic policy roadmap and a mechanism for the implementation of such a policy. So the questions for the African countries is less about whether they need to have national security strategy, but more of how to develop and implement such a policy. The second question from the two uh, round table is about the, uh, why why process of national security strategy development is more important than the document itself. The process of designing and crafting any public policy creates opportunities and space for genuine national conversation and nurturing trust between and among stakeholders. This is more important to the national security strategy development process as a sector that is characterized by the culture of secrecy and exclusion of citizens in the way security is perceived, planned, managed, and delivered. Then the other question, why leadership matters in the process of national security strategy development? Using the words of the Donald Heptis, the national security strategy development process needs not only the leaders to lead, but leadership with ability to shape security environment. Equally, the national security strategy development process also does not need a technical leadership with known solution, but a strategic and adaptive leadership 
able to invent new problem-driven solution to thrive in a crisis environment by providing a strategic security vision. And the last question, why inclusive and participatory national security strategy development process is important. There is a wealth of cumulative and convincing evidence that shows an inclusive and participatory national security process is more likely to help the security sector leaders to confront better the complex security threats. As citizens are the primary beneficiaries of the delivery of security services, they become key critical stakeholders in the way security is planned, managed, and delivered. Now, let me turn to the, uh, this session. This session will be focusing on the national security strategy, implementation, and sectorial security strategy. So one of the main objective of this session are the following. One, we'll be discussing the ways national security strategy process can provide mechanism to ensure implementation. Second objective is to examine the link between national security strategy and sectorial strategies, such as defense or counterterrorism strategies and how they support the implementation of the national security strategy. Third, to discuss how national security strategy process can improve coordination and decision-making mechanism through more effective division of labor in the security sector. And the last objective, to share some of the common challenges during national security strategy implementation and how these challenges could be overcome. Let me now introduce to you the panelists. I am really pleased to welcome three outstanding and seasoned experts and practitioners on the national security strategy development and public policy implementation, who will help us to start the conversation about the practical process of implementing national security strategy in Africa. As you have their bios, I will highlight some relevant aspects of their expertise and qualification. Let me start first with Dr. Mats Andrews. I'm really delighted for us to have him today. It's not only because of everything, but I will highlight some why we feel we are so happy having him. First, he's a senior lecturer in public policy at Harvard Kennedy School. He's a faculty chair of an online executive education program on implementing public policy at Harvard Kennedy School. Really, I recommend you to look at that program on online, and it is one of the very outstanding program on the implementation of public policy generally. Uh, Dr. Matt is also the author of a paper titled, Implementing Public Policy, Is It Possible to Escape the Public Policy Futility Trap by Harvard Kennedy School? It is this, this paper, it is one of our required reading for this session. Matt, I'm a, some of the people being inspired by his work, and especially this, he is the co-author of Harvard Kennedy School Research Working Paper titled Escaping Fragility Traps Through Problem-Driven Iterative Adaptation, which is known for PDIA. And the PDIA is a practical approach for addressing complex problems such as security threat. I encourage all of you to use your own time to understand this important approach. I'm one of the people that use this PDIA to share our program in the Africa Center. Although Matt will not be talking about the PDIA in this program, but I would like you to really look at this PDIA as a practical approach in addressing security challenges in, in Africa. His research at the Africa at the Harvard Kennedy School focused on public sector reform, particularly 
participatory governance in development and transition government. And he served as a public sector specialist at the World Bank. He holds a Bachelor of Commerce with honors, honors degree from the University of Natal, South Africa, and Master of Science from the University of London, and a PhD in public administration from the Maxwell School. Dr. Mars, you are most welcome, and we are so delighted having you today with us. The second panelist is Brigadier General, retired uh, Salah Bala. He is the Chief Exhibit Executive Officer of White Inc. Consultancy. He's a private consultancy firm focusing on defense and security issues. And this firm is based in Abuja, Nigeria. Uh, General Bala, he participated in the development of the National Security Such Development uh, Toolkit. He has been serving as a resource person for the academic program of the Africa Center. He's a trained professional officer in Nigeria, Army, and a retired as the Brigadier General. He served as a special, as a senior a special advisor for policy and strategy development to the Federal Ministry of Interior of Nigeria. He holds a master degree in international peace studies from the University of Peace. Uh, in Costa Rica. And he holds also as well another master's degree in national security strategy from the National Defense University in Washington. General Bala, you are well, most welcome to share with us your experience. The last but not least is Dr. Philly Shepu. He is an independent expert in conflict and security and reviewed our national security strategy development toolkit. He's a rostered expert for the International Security Sector Advisory Team. And she worked at the Af and she worked previously at the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance, a world-leading center in security governance. She holds a master's degree from the Geneva Graduate Institute and a doctor from the Otto Suho Institute of Political Science at the Fiere University Berlin. So we are so, thank you very much, Feli, to be with us. Let me start our conversation first now uh, with, with Dr. Marz. Uh, Dr. Marz, um, your reading is one of the good readings that we have provided in this, uh, for this session. And really we would like to start with you that public policy implementation failure seem to be a universal phenomena in, in generally, but for the case of Africa, how can, how, can, how can you describe how common is this public policy implementation failure in Africa or in the developed countries? And it would be good if you can also share with us what constitute a public policy failure or success. Dr. Marx, you are welcome. Thank you so much. It's really great to be with everybody. And, um, you know, I'm not a, a security expert. So I sit in on these conversations with uh, a significant amount of respect and awe for, for all of you for, for what you do. Um, but my focus is really looking at public policy of all sorts, mostly in developing countries. The first question that you, 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 I will address is what do we think about failure? How do we assess failure? What does it look like? Public policy success and failure is actually tremendously hard to think about. There are um, a number of different dimensions of what you would think about in success or failure. One is what we would call the programmatic dimension, which is essentially when we plan out a policy, we tend to say, what are the inputs? What are the outputs? What are the outcomes? Um, and what, what will effectiveness look like? Many of you will know this kind of language, especially when you are in a developing country, because this is the language of the World Bank, this is the language of the United Nations, this is the language of the OECD. It's also the language of programmatic project management thinking. Um, but that's only one dimension of success. Uh, another dimension of success is what we call the process dimension of success, where we say, look, it doesn't only matter if you achieve your output, outputs and your outcomes, 
It also matters how you achieve your outputs and your outcomes. That if you do so in a way that is considered fair and equitable, that is important. If you do some in a way that is considered unfair or corrupt, that also matters. There's another dimension, which is just the raw political dimension. How does the policy impact the political narrative and the political situation in a context? And we're now talking most only about success in kind of like a short to a medium term. When we talk about success in the long term, we say, okay, whether or not you had a good programmatic uh, uh, achievement, whether or not your policy process was considered um, appropriate and whether or not you managed to stay alive politically by keeping your political masters happy, what happened in the long run? Did you actually improve the lives of people? Did you actually create a sustainable policy that could last uh, through time? So all of these dimensions are really hard to kind of think about. Um, but when we do think about them, here's the kind of narrative that I would suggest to you based on the data that we have. The, 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 the data that we have specifically for Africa comes from um, the World Bank. Now, the World Bank is a very big organization that sponsors certain kinds of policy interventions. Um, and why we look at World Bank data is that we have project evaluations for five, 6,000 different policy interventions, and we just don't have comparative data from anywhere else. Usually when we look at success, we do case studies and they are individual case studies or of a few cases. If we wanna say how regularly do we succeed or fail, we wanna get a big sample and the World Bank gives us that sample. We have hundreds of policy interventions uh, in, um, in individual countries, tens of thousands if you look across countries and over time. Mostly what they look at is what I was calling that programmatic dimension of things. They don't really focus on the political dimension, but they do also have a focus that looks at the long term. They assess the programmatic dimension by saying how satisfactory are projects, and then they assess the long term dimension. We're asking what is the risk that we won't actually achieve objectives. They have a 75% success rate in across all of the world on whether or not they achieve their programmatic goals, which we can discuss the, the nature of the evaluations, but that's essentially what they have. But when they say, do we think this is gonna last into the future? The success rate is closer to 30%. And that's the thing that I think is quite interesting is that what you see is actually people in the short run saying, okay, did we manage to um, introduce a new program? Did we establish a new anti-corruption unit? Yes, tick, 75% of the time. Do we have any, any hope that that anti-corruption unit is going to affect corruption? 30% uh, of the time. So that's where we get into a very interesting narrative where firstly, we have created a way of talking about success that allows us to say that we are more successful than we might be. Um, and when we actually say, are we solving the world's problems? Are we solving the problems of our people? We are much less successful or at least much less confident of our success than we are about kind of just delivering short, short run products. So that's where we start to engage at Harvard in this problem of how do we change people's thinking about success from the short run programmatic dimension to this long run, are we actually solving the problems that people face? Because that's where we only have a success rate of about 30%. Yeah, 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 yeah. thank you very much, uh, uh, um, um, Matt, for such uh, defining the failure or success. And uh, we'll follow up with you later on, maybe from the participant about why is such often? So the second question is really about what are the main factors for public policy implementation failure, particularly in the developed countries and, and Africa in particular? Thank you. So, you know, there are many, many factors and there's a lot of ways to think about this question. The, the article that you've read about the fertility trap, it captures this in not just a kind of a technical way, but also a relational way. So, you know, traditionally in the literature, people would say, well, why do projects fail or why does policy fail? And they would say things like they weren't designed well or we didn't monitor well, et cetera. Those things are true. Often in Africa, another thing we need to think about is that many of the policies are new. And when we are addressing new things, we don't know what we're doing. 
And so there's a really interesting thought about, well, if you don't know what you're doing, how could you develop this perfect plan? And if you don't know what you're doing, would it really work to kind of monitor your plan and make sure that people are, are pursuing their plan? And what we find is that actually the way that policy is made in places like Africa assumes that we know exactly where we're going. And we know not only where the journey starts, but where the journey ends and exactly what the roads are. And we can plan it out. And when we talk about when we fail, we say, well, we just needed to plan better. We have a different perspective. And we say, firstly, we think that policies fail often because we don't spend enough time understanding what the problem is we're dealing with. Secondly, we don't develop a dynamic and flexible way of then solving the problem that allows us to learn. And we find that this failure to learn is probably the biggest problem in most countries today. Because if you don't know the problem because you haven't dealt with it before or you haven't successfully dealt with it before, it means that you need to learn. And we need to develop policy processes that allow us to learn really quickly. Now, when we don't learn, we find ourselves getting into what we call the futility trap. And the futility trap, I've got it on the board in the back and it's very simple and you may not be able to see it, but I'm gonna tell you what it is so that you can see it. Is firstly, when we have problems in society, we say, well, we need to respond to the problem, but often we jump really quickly to a solution and we look for outside consultants and we look for outside entities and we, we, they give us the solution. And then what we find is that our efforts don't work. And often they don't work, not because we're bad at it, but they don't work because we jump towards a solution, but the solution wasn't a solution to our problem. Because as I said earlier, the problems that we're facing are new or they are new contexts in which we're facing old problems. And every context has its own politics, its own people, its own relationships. And when you fail in your efforts, what happens is that the people you're serving lose confidence in you. And the people who are delivering lose confidence in their ability to deliver. And that then leads to efforts failing again and puts you in what we call the futility trap which means that we have a problem, we try to solve the problem, we fail at trying to solve the problem. Our citizens look at us and they say, you see, you can't do it. We look at ourselves and you say, we see, we can't do it. We try again and we fail, the problem festers and we find ourselves in this trap. When we look at countries, we find that many countries, many sectors are in this trap. It's not that they aren't trying things again and again, but the things are failing and eroding the confidence. This is one of the reasons why, if you look across Africa, a lot of the data on trust and confidence in government is extremely low. Not only is it low with the citizens, it's low with the bureaucrats. It's low with the officials who meant to do the delivery. They do not believe in themselves. The citizens do not believe in them, which is what we call the relational dimension of failure. And it almost becomes baked into your society. We expect that we are going to fail. We expect that our, our efforts are futile. And, 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 and we see that this is happening all over the place. And what you therefore need is something that disrupts this trap, something that causes people to behave in a different way. And it, the key intervention point is to focus on the problems in a different way and not have effort, efforts that are based on short-term solutions, but really focus on the problem Bring your bureaucrats, bring your society into a conversation about what is it that we need to address? What would success look like? And start building partnerships in the efforts to solve things that are very contextual um, and that don't jump towards solutions too fast. Oh, oh Dr. Mart, uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, beside that one, I would like you also to highlight later on also uh, how to escape, especially the diagram on the escaping the fragility, the futility trap. But let me just anchor this discussion to the, uh, the challenges of implementing a national security strategy. As I mentioned, we have a toolkit of how to develop national security strategy. And, uh, and the real question is how can we avoid, even though you have a, a development national security, we have a very good policies on the continent well articulated uh, uh, policies and uh, and especially specific on the national security strategy, how can we avoid a failure uh, for this national security strategy uh, implementation? And in particular, um, how can a national security strategy be made a living document that is adaptive, 
uh, to dynamic reality in an iterative way, especially considering the extra, extraordinary shocks like the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I don't want you to, 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 to give us a lot of seeing about the PDI, but the idea is really how to use the PDI in order to make a, this national security strategy document as a living document that is adaptive in an iterative way. And maybe you can just highlight within the context of the escaping the futility trap. Uh, you are welcome, uh, Dr. Mark. Thank you. I, I think, um, you know, the one thing that I would say is we need to get out of the habit of developing strategies that, pr that, that provide answers that, that, that aren't really answers. And I think that's the first thing. Usually when we develop strategies, what we do is we say to people, tell us the solution to our problem. And we're asking them to answer that question in a passive way, meaning, you know, we're going to policy designers and experts and we're saying to them, write a 300 page strategy that tells us exactly what we do you need to do over the next five years, exactly how we spend our money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then what we're going to do is we're going to monitor it based on what's in the document. And we're going to uh, assess people based on their compliance with the strategy. What we're saying is that's a fine strategy and a fine way to do strategic uh, planning if you know what you're doing. If you know exactly what you're doing and if you have the answer and you've done the answer before. I often say to people, the difference between an idea and a solution is an idea is something that you have tried and you've seen work. And the problem with most of our strategies, I mean, sorry, a solution is an idea is that you, that you have tried and you've seen work. The problem with most of our strategies is that they're full of ideas, but we treat the ideas as if they're solutions. And, we, and we, we structure them in so we can't get them out. They become like a straitjacket for us. And we don't think, therefore, about what is the process of learning. And we don't think that learning itself is an element of success. And what I would suggest is what you want to do in your strategies is you want to say to yourself, where do we absolutely know that that's the answer? And there we bake it in and we put it in a traditional plan. Here's how we're going to do things. Where it's just an idea and we still need to test it and we still need to prove it and we still need to learn about it. We need to bring a different strategy into the planning documentation. And that strategy needs to essentially say, how do we bring people together so that those people can start building their confidence again. So let's throw, let's put ideas together and let's have people work in short bursts where they try things out and they see what happens. Where they talk to each other a lot and they say, what did we learn? Where are we making progress? Where are we not making progress? And they therefore find their way over the strategic period instead of pretending that they know the way right at the beginning. That's essentially the way in which you create a disruptive force that breaks the futility trap, but it's the way that you do it through planning mechanisms. Um, so the strategy needs to be a lot more about the process of learning, not just about the set of solutions and programming those solutions in. And that pro program of learning is the way in which you essentially start with saying, Let's have an honest conversation about the problems that we face. Let's bring people together. Let's break the problems down. We have questions. We say, what's the problem? We say, how do you measure the problem? We say, why does the problem matter? Who does the problem matter to? Who, do we, who does it need to matter to more? Then we break it down into its causes and say, do we understand what's causing the problem? And then we identify ideas to address those causes. And we mobilize teams of what we would call passive policymakers, who are often the, the researchers, the experts, active policymakers who are the implementers at the street level, citizens and politicians. Bring them into teams and have those teams try things out, right? So you're not necessarily trying efforts that then fail. You are trying interventions where your goal is to learn. And if you learn, you don't solve the problem, but you start to build confidence instead of erode the confidence because people start to say, oh, we tried this and it works. Has it solved the problem? No, it hasn't solved the problem, but we've seen that we can do things. We've seen that our government can do things. Small steps, small steps, small steps. Then we try again and we start to realize that we understand the problem more. Then we can go back and we can have efforts that are more informed, that are better, that bring the right people together, and we can go through that process, and we can essentially turn 
the futility trap into a learning opportunity and the learning opportunity builds confidence and builds trust. You'll hear those two words that I mentioned quite a lot is confidence and trust. Confidence and trust within your system with the officials who are meant to be coming up with the ideas and implementing them and in your broader system with your citizens who need to support you and in the broader system with the politicians who keep you in place. A lot of people say, well, I couldn't do this in our political environment because the politicians don't give us enough time, et cetera, et cetera. What this process is designed to do is to constantly give progress indicators to the politicians so that the politicians are satisfied that you are moving in the right direction so that they can use that information to constantly communicate to their voting base to say, we are doing things for you, we're doing things for you, we're doing things for you. So it's a dynamic process of interplay where instead of trying things and failing and losing confidence, you try small things, you learn, you build confidence, you build trust in your people uh, internally, externally, and with your political authorizers. And you almost work your way towards success rather than pretending you know what success is and just locking it into a strategy. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Martz. I, maybe I want to push it further than that. Um, and it's good, the, the whole of the problem driven. I think this is very important adaptation in iterative way. I, I, I just can you highlight this adaptation in, a, in a, given the fact, for example, COVID-19 as a shock, unexpected crisis. How can, how can a strategy be able to adapt in an iterative way with such a shock and unexpected? Uh, and uh, yeah. There's no other way to deal with COVID-19. The countries that dealt with COVID-19 well from the beginning were the ones that iterated from the start. Yeah. The countries that did poorly were the ones that pretended that they had a solution. I'm in a country now where we had people saying, what you need is to take this medicine and this medicine and this medicine and this medicine, right? Uh, and, and all of those things didn't work, right? You had other places. So Singapore from the beginning, for instance, started off and they said, we think that COVID-19 looks like SARS. We think this. Mm -hmm. This is literally what the prime minister of Singapore did. He said, we think that it looks like SARS. Based on our under, uh, understanding of SARS, here's what we understand in terms of how we're going to deal with it. And one of the things, for instance, they said is when we had SARS, we could keep churches open. And in many cases, the issue of keeping churches or mosques or synagogues open so that people could worship is a very big deal when you close society down. That is a defining issue. It is a very big political issue. So they said right from the start, we are going to keep the churches open. We, when we had SARS, we didn't need to close them. But they also said, we don't know if we have that right. So we are going to be gathering evidence of what is happening at those gatherings and whether or not the risk is higher than we think. And we will come back to you and tell you if we change our minds based on that evidence. So they didn't just pretend that they had the answer. They said, we think we have an idea that we can do that, but we also have a question mark. So, the, so essentially, we're going to say the problem is that we have this virus that we don't fully understand, right? We need to understand it. So we're going to see how people gather and we're going to see what happens. Within two weeks, they came back to the Singaporean people and they said, we've collected data and we see that COVID-19 is spreading at religious gatherings. So we are stopping religious gatherings, but the reason why we're stopping is because of this thing that we learned, right? So you can see the, the process of saying, we have a problem, we don't fully understand it, what do we need to do to learn about it? Communicating with people what's going on and iterating. You find that this iteration has been a, a, a key factor of a lot of countries' responses. They've iterated to say, how do we deal at airports? They've iterated to say, how do we deal um, how do we deal with care facilities? The ones that made big errors were the ones that made a decision early on and then stuck to that and didn't collect data. Think, for instance, about now two places where um, the COVID spread happened in nursing homes. One was in New York State and the other one was in Scotland. In both places, very early on, what they said is, we send um, older people back to the nursing homes where they come from, and that's where they're going to be safest. And right at the beginning, they decided that's the solution. 
They didn't say to themselves, the problem is that this is a vulnerable population and we don't know how to keep them safe, right? Now, in, in, you see the two different ways of thinking. The one is it's a vulnerable population. We really need to keep them safe. We don't know how to keep them safe. The other one is it's a vulnerable population. The way we keep them safe is sending them back to the nursing homes. When they sent them back to the nursing homes, what happened is that they got a lot of COVID and a lot of people died. And in Scotland and in New York state, that's where most people died. And they died because of a policy error, right? Now, imagine if they'd said, we think that sending them back to the nursing homes is a really good idea, okay? But we have a question mark about it. So we're gonna send them back, but we are going to collect active data on the situation on a day by day by day basis, because if we get this wrong, the downside is too much. If they'd done that within a week, within two weeks, they would have said, the data's bad, we need to change our strategy. What new ideas do we have? That's where you hear a difference. We understand that we have a problem. We're gonna respect that the problem is something that we may not fully understand. We're going to try an idea out, but we're going to collect data to see if our idea is right, and we're gonna learn, and we're going to change the idea if we need to. It's the only way that you can deal with new, new threats. Right from the beginning, we defined, we said that the uh, COVID-19 was a novel coronavirus, but in too many places, we treated it as an old coronavirus. It's novel. It remains novel. The response to it is novel. Where we are now is countries, and think about in Africa, how many countries shut down? Why did they shut down? They shut down because other countries were shutting down and they just copied them right? Yeah. But then they find that the shutdown couldn't be maintained, it couldn't be withheld. And instead, what they should have said is our problem is that there is this virus. How does this virus work in a country where most of the people don't have places to, to hide, most of the people are informal, uh, where we don't have supply chains, etc. Instead of having a question mark and creating evidence and learning, they jump towards a solution and not everybody, but some countries jump towards solutions and I think that they find that they got stuck and it exacerbated either the economic side or the public health side. We need to develop both this inquisitive nature where we say we don't know the answer and then also the processes that allow us to learn. That's how we deal with this kind of challenge. Yeah, oh yeah, Dr. Matt, thank you very much. Being an African, you know our conditions better than anybody. But I think what Matt is saying is, is very important to know. I think maybe just to highlight some few points is that we have three types and Matt's articulated very well, three types of problem. A simple problem, complicated problem and complex problem. And I think what he's saying is that the complex problem like security uh, threats are complex. You don't need to have uh, cut and paste uh, solutions. You have to, so having a problem driven but even having an evidence that you learn from is another way of adapting and making a strategy to be a living government. Uh, so Matt, I think you are, thank you really very much. And for the participants, really this is an opportunity for you to ask Matt about any specific questions. And I, that's why I refer you for two documents, uh, his online executive program, but as well as his, uh, his, uh, his uh, well articulated paper on the PDIA, the problem driven iterative adaptation. Please, is a concept that I really encourage all the participants to look into it as, as a tool that will be relevant to your only daily life. Please type in your question to Matt uh, so that later on he will be able to answer your question. It's a good opportunity for you to engage with Matt at this particular point. Please ask your question so that he will be able to answer question. Matt, thank you very much. And, uh, and uh, really, I'm really delighted. Um, let me move now to, uh, to the, the second panelist, that is General Bala. General Bala is from Nigeria, as I mentioned earlier. And Nigeria has two policies. They, they developed a policy in 2014, and then that uh, national security policy, and then that national security policy being reviewed in 2019. So I will discuss about the issue of the, uh, the public policy uh, uh, in terms of the security. So General Bala, based on close monitoring of security events in Nigeria. How would you, what do you think about the, the 2019, 2014 
Nigerian national security policy was implemented. Yes, yes, your own sense. I know you cannot be able to make a judgment about it, but I want to have your sense of how the 2014 national, national security policy was implemented. Uh, General Bala, you are welcome. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, 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 Dr. Luca. And I must say that I feel highly privileged to be invited to participate in this, uh, 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 in this uh, 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 training. Uh, one fact is, yes, we must understand the context to, uh, in which we are, we are speaking. Uh, a country like, like Nigeria at 2014 was uh, not up to, was just crossing about the first decade of its into, uh, into, uh, into, into democratic rule. So for two, uh, by the second transition, it means that uh, Nigeria was actually learning the, the democratic uh, process and that uh, the polity itself was getting demilitarized. Uh, so this is, it is very, very important to understand this, that institutions were being rebuilt and reforms, especially for the public sector itself, which was weakened by military rule, had to be built. And we quite know that the public surface is indeed the avenue. It is the conduit to, through which political policy is being uh, is being uh, uh, is being worked to is being uh, worked to become really political goods to the people. So essentially, um, one goes back a little bit to history that the whole idea of having a strategy for security, for national security, started in, in the year 20, uh, in the year uh, 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 2000, with the grand strategy for national security, by which went ahead such that it was only about 2013 that a real effort at, at uh, 2012, I beg your pardon, that a real effort at developing a national security strategy was done. So we can see that by 2014, that the security policy was enunciated. Already Nigeria was knee deep in transition, political transitions, as well as the pressure of the Boko Haram crisis. So just like Matt said, uh, it is not quite about looking at policies from a point of view of failure or a point of view of success, but iteratively to see how small wins uh, uh, develop and how a public sector actually learns over the time on how the best way to deliver on a definite poli uh, 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 policy uh, pillar, which in this case uh, would, be, would be security. So with the enunciation of the 2014 national security uh, 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 policy, I go back again to re-emphasize that it was at a very, very critical period of Nigeria's political history that 2014 itself was a campaign year. 2013, 2014 was steep in political uh, campaigns and the effort of the government to continue. So the public sector effort, the political side of the bureaucracy, which really should drive the main public sector by itself was diverted from the energy of ensuring that national policy was delivered on the path of implementation as was pro uh, promised by, by campaign, uh, by campaign uh, 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 through campaign uh, uh, promises. Um, and this speaks to the outline that I have made to discuss this matter that you need a focus of champion leaders to be able to drive this policy implementation to success. And you have the political champions themselves in a struggle to prolongate their political, uh, their tenures. So that itself distracts 
in a state like Nigeria at that, at that period that didn't have the strong public institutions to be able to separate, to separate itself from, from, uh, from, uh, from the political effort of driving the nation. So the champions, rather, who should give political direction to the public sector, to the civil service, to the bureaucracy, to drive the system were by, by themselves distracted in, election, uh, in campaigns and electioneering in order to ensure uh, uh, continuity of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of regime. Then there is the issue of strategy culture. A system, a nation needs to have a very strategic discipline, culture, of doing things. It, well, one will ask: At that time, was the was uh, was the uh, was Nigeria not coming out of military rule? Very much so, but it it was not in the democratic, strategic, discipline culture where you have process by which uh, uh, by which programs are delivered, and also with the adherence to the rule of law. There, were, there weren't uh, oversight institutions. There weren't discipline ministries, so to speak, that have check uh, and balances from the executive, judiciary, and the parliament to ensure that there is enduring discipline in driving uh, public sector policies to fruition. Yeah. But then, okay. yeah, then there is but there were opportunities that came up. There were the extreme uh, effects of crisis. There was the pressure also to demilitarize the system by itself. All these issues I'm bringing up are in fact included as principles to be achieved in the 2014 uh, 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 strategy. Then, yeah. so much. You want to go to the next question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. General Bala, I, I, what you are saying, indeed, the 2014 Nigerian national security policy faced a lot of challenges to be implemented. But the real question is what are the factors, as highlighted by Matthew, that could explain? The, uh, the public policy implementation failure and how relevant are some of the factors that mentioned by Matt to the case of the implementation of the 2014 Nigerian national security policy. Uh, very much. Would, you can be very, yeah, just highlight some of these factors. I think you highlight some of them, but it would be good to be very clear about what are some of the factors that actually hinder the full implementation of 2014 national uh, security policy of Nigeria. If we would go back to the basis of the strategy itself, firstly, was to secure the nation because the nation was still grappling with the Niger Delta militancy and the Boko Haram crisis and the emerging sectarian divides. So there was policy of government to secure the state. Secondly, to secure the economy and to unite the nation. And like I referred to, that the problems as, as uh, analyzed and in according to the futility traps, while these are the three problems, the important, the important solutions that need to drive the solving of this problem was the leadership and at that period of the enunciation of the 2014 uh, elections, as I framed it in my conversation, was very much a process of learning, was still a process of learning the democratic process. And it was smack at a time at which there were electioneering. And then a new leadership was trying to also settle itself within the transition. So the problem as it came to what effort there were. We came into the Buhari administration and the Buhari administration for these problems just thought that like Matt in fact too, 
that a stronger anti-corruption institution was the solution. And also upscaling the effort of the military in the Northeast was also a, a one and final solution. It wasn't iterative. It, there wasn't quite a learning process in how this solution, which otherwise were just pulled out as if by instinct, could have been iteratively been learned and programmed in order to solve uh, uh, this, these problems. And as you know also, in the strategic spectrum and the crisis situation of, of a state, there are surprises in the fogs and friction of, uh, of a nation. In doing that, there was an exacerbation indeed of the Boko Haram crisis. And this very much upset the pace at which the implementation indeed of the sectoral strategy, which was the now enunciated 2016 counter-terrorism strategy, which was yielded from the 2014 uh, uh, national security strategy by itself had a problem of execution because there was more a focus on the military solution. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think General Ballas, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, really my last question now, Nigeria has reviewed the 2014 and, uh, and updated in 2019. In your own thinking, what could be done differently to successfully implement the 2019 Nigerian national security policy, particularly in terms of the development of national security strategy as a plan of action with an implementation matrix and a supporting uh, sectoral security policies and strategies. Uh, just in brief, I would appreciate, how can we do differently to implement successful the 2019, taking in your mind also the uh, what Matt said is keeping the uh, futility trap. Yeah, uh, like I like I inferred to in my first uh, uh, in my first intervention, I am someone who believes very very strongly in in leadership, especially in a developing nation, and that it is very very important that sectoral leaders in the course of implementing strategies are really taken along and given quite some level of initiative, just like in the military, we speak about the uh, 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 command initiative, that that is the mi mission command. Because implementation at the sectoral level is technical and very, very uh, uh, along professional lines, it is important that there must not be micromanagement as much as there should be a clear directives issued from the highest level with clear, uh, uh, with, uh, with, with clear key, uh, with clear KIPs so that sectoral leaders will clearly know what by time bound requirement, what achievements they must make drawing from the uh, national security strategy in order to develop their own strategies to meet those milestones that have been spelled out to them in the overarching uh, uh, in the overarching descriptions of what achievements that their various sectors must achieve. And this still goes back to the very important issue of having square pegs in square holes. Leadership must be well qualified and there must be overarching central political leadership that should give clear political directives and also support uh, the sectoral uh, uh, leaders with appropriate funding so that they are able uh, funding and support that they are able to acquire whatever uh, uh, whatever assets that is required to deliver on this the 2019 reviewed policy is very, uh, uh, national security policy is very 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 clear on that and it is interesting that drawn from that if one refers to Nigeria's cybersecurity uh, 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 policy and strategy. One could see 
that at the end of that document, there is an annex, which is the implementation metrics. And in fact, a two and a half page outline and directive on how this implementation metrics should be implemented. It is very, very, very clear on what the particular tasks, the, impl uh, the implied tasks, including what other agencies are to collaborate in order to deliver on that operational line. Proposals on the budget for the implementation of that ed and clearly spelled out KIPs and and, uh, and, 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 and and evidence of achieving those pillars. I think if the next national security, uh, national security policy for Nigeria, because the current 2019 review doesn't have a clearly spelled out implementation pro, uh, uh, program as much as there, there is one in the national uh, cyber uh, security policy and strategy, it also shows that there is an iterative uh, approach of learning to the mistakes that have been made earlier, it would be recommended that such a, a, a metrics is also provided in the overarching national security policy so that sectoral, uh, uh, sectoral uh, leaders will also be able to draw directly from, their, uh, from the national security strategy by timeline what they are supposed to achieve and what the expectations are. Excellent. No, no, thank you very much, Gerald uh, uh, Bala. And, uh, and I think this is very important that the, uh, that, that it still a lot of opportunity for Nigeria to implement its uh, 2019 national security policy because they will be going for the second phase of the uh, developing national security strategy as, as a, a, a plan of action of how to implement. And I believe they will learn a lot from the experience of 2014. I would like to refer to the participants. The, uh, the, uh, the national security strategy uh, policy of Nigeria is one of the case studies we have provided. But I would like you also to look at the, uh, the Liberia case study, which is a good example, providing a very good uh, matrix for the implementation. It's one of the very good policy uh, document that you can refer to. So thank you very much, uh, uh, General Bala. And uh, let me now move to uh, to uh, Fairly. Um, Dr. Fairly, I think you you review the the the, the national security Study development toolkit. Yes, can you share briefly the key elements of phase seven of the national security Study development process in terms of the implementation and mechanism, including the decision making process, division of labor coordination. So what are the key challenges to be encountered during this phase of the implementation? And based on the maps and 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 uh, and, and general Bala uh, contribution. Uh, Dr. Fela, you are welcome. Thank you, Dr. Luca. It's a delight to be back here for the third round of our um, of our series. And I'm so glad also that the Africa Centre has decided to invest in spending time talking and thinking about this issue because it is crucial. Um, and in fact, it's perhaps more crucial than its position in the toolkit suggests because um, we, if, for those of you, I think you're all familiar with the toolkit at this stage, but implementation monitoring and evaluation is the seventh of phase that we've identified in, in national security strategy development. And in fact, that's a bit of a misnomer um, because uh, a national security strategy has to be a living document that's always going to be changing and adapting to the, the national context and the security challenges that a country faces. So what this phase is really about is about not only putting a strategy to work, but also learning from that strategy so that it, what is learned can be fed into the next strategy. And in that way, while we count through one through seven, the reason there's no eighth step or eighth phase in national security strategy development is because we need to go right back to step number one. And in fact, that's a key thing that, should, that we need to understand with uh, phase seven because 
right up until now, I think in the first two um, parts of our series, we've really spent a lot of time talking about the role of a national security strategy as a vision, um, a national idea of, of what security should be, for whom it should be, and how it should look and what should be done. And that's very important. That's an incredibly important um, role that national security strategies play. But in order for this um, to go beyond uh, that level of vision and become a practical document, so it needs to be more than just a beautiful statement that decorates offices, uh, it needs to be a practical tool. And what that means is the national security strategy has to change things about how every part of the security sector works and what it's moving towards. And that's what the seventh phase is about, this implementation part. So how does it get there? What it means is every part of the um, inside, every institution of the security sector needs to change processes of planning, processes of administration, resource allocation and operational objectives all need to move to align with the missions and tasks that are outlined in the overarching strategy. That doesn't happen in one step. It happens through the development of more specific strategies that align with the overarching national strategy. We call these sectoral strategies and institutional strategies. And then at some level, there's a there's um, sort of working level planning going on. So what that means in, in phase seven of, of the toolkit, what you'll find is we talk about a little bit about this. And then we also talk about the need for the drafting committee to develop implementation guidelines. Um, you've he heard it here called um, an implementation matrix. Um, and this is really a, a sort of tableau. It's kind of really just a, a table really um, that picks up on key things that would need to happen or need to change in that the national that the drafting committee has identified in drafting the national security strategy and sets out a timeline um, and perhaps assigns um, a, a division of labor who's going to do what on what time planning to get this done um, you've just heard that nigeria and both and liberia both use this kind of planning tool to to say okay we've got a vision here's how we want to move towards it so that's one aspect of the implementation phase. But the second part, um, which is really important, is uh, this is the point where the drafting committee um, or the, the initiators need to establish a follow-up mechanism to monitor the implementation of the national security strategy. That is what, um, that is that authority that will make it, make the process circular, make it iterative and make it practical. Um, that that's how you get away from a linear approach that is just a statement about values and doesn't that doesn't change anything. Um, this is exactly what uh, Dr. Andrews was talking about where this is, this is the part of the policy process where we do the learning. This is where um, this is the, the mechanism whereby we look under the hood, see what's working and not working inside the security sector during implementation and hopefully um, can identify actions to correct course within the objectives that have been identified and amp up potential solutions but also signal that this is not working or that perhaps for other reasons there's a need to return to, to the strategy and start again. There's lots of possible approaches to monitoring um, and it's really important to choose one that um, and apply one that is really well fitted to the national context and also to the institutional context of the security strategy. And that means asking questions about what's the level of familiarity and knowledge of, of monitoring and evaluation in this context? What are the resources available, both financial, the people? What institutions are gonna be handling this and how are they equipped to do that in order to be able to choose a, a way of setting up a, a follow-up mechanism that will work. It also needs to be um, the type of mechanism that can look at how the security strategy itself is being implemented whilst keeping an eye on the larger political and security context where implementation is taking place. And this is this is really the um, the, the working mechanism that will that will follow up on implementation guidelines that are developed. So that's what that's what phase seven really um, covers. In terms of challenges, uh, <laughs> there are many and they are diverse. <laughs> um, probably I would say that the, the single most important challenge um, for all of this is realist, realistic goal setting and planning. Um, that means that uh, what can be asking the question about what can be done 
to, to work towards the priorities that the strategy identifies whilst working within both the resources and the time available. That sounds simple, it's very complicated <laughs> in practice. Um, there are several, th several aspects to this. One of the challenges is ensuring that all of the security sector actors who will eventually be responsible for implementing a strategy are involved in feeding the information necessary to make a realistic strategy to the drafting committee early on in the process. So way back at the beginning when we were talking about planning, we were talking about prepare preparations for security sector drafting, that is the time when uh, a drafting committee should be asking all of the different parts of the security sector to, to inform them about what their current capacity levels are, what their current challenges are, what the status quo is, so that as they move to develop solutions, it's based on a, real, a realistic understanding of what the current state of play is. So that means getting Getting these actors involved much before implementation, much before set, um, phase seven. Another challenge is financial governance in all of this. Um, a key purpose for a national security strategy is to, is to create a framework for the rational use of limited national resources. There is never, ever, in any context, enough money available to pay for the security we want. It's always going to have an infinite price tag. But that actually doesn't matter because money is not usually the main problem <laughs> to providing security. Um, what, in fact, does matter is that what, within the envelope of national resources made available, the best value for money is being had. And that, but that also means that there needs to be good control of budgets, um, mechanisms in place to prevent diversion and, and budget blowouts. So that's a challenge. Another aspect is establishing a clear division of labor within the security sector itself related to implementation because the missions and the roles of security actors need to be clear because they may overlap, especially when it comes to things like internal security. Um, and this means that there needs to be some sort of coordination mechanism in place that can um, resolve difficulties and disagreements and impasses as they emerge. Uh, and it's that may or may not be linked to the follow up of the implementation of a national security strategy. It really depends on the context. Um, a further challenge, and the, uh, this is the second to last one, is institutional weakness. Um, it's really important to consider the capacity of an institution, whether it's a ministry or a security force or an oversight body, to get the job done that has been handed to it. That's a question about personnel levels, about training, about knowledge, um, motivation. It's a question about available material and equipment. Um, it's, a, it's a question about budgets, but often it's a question about the capacity to absorb budgets and manage them effectively rather than a simple question about the sum total. And this is also the part which relates to the aspects that both General Bala and Dr. Andrews were talking about, where General Bala was talking about the challenges of um, making these changes when there's not the strategic and democratic culture in place um, that is that is used to this. And, and this is also what um, I think what Dr. Andrews was talking about where um, you know, are we, do we even know what good looks like? Uh, to what extent are people familiar with the ideas that they're trying to work towards um, and the difference between an idea and it having to prove its metal before it's a solution? Um, this is uh, something that would be really important to consider when looking at institutional weaknesses. And then finally, a challenge that will be familiar to many of you is the challenge of political interference or neglect in the implementation of the national security strategy. So a national security strategy is a tool for political um, accountability. And that's why it's so important to have the highest possible level of political buy-in way back at the beginning of the process. Remember at phase one, when we were talking about initiation and we talked so lot much about the need for high level buy-in, this is partly where, because when the rubber hits the road at the implementation phase, you will need high level political buy-in either to continue political investment in the implementation of the project or to prevent inappropriate interference, which might um, sabotage things. Um, so that's also another reason why we need to think of NSSD as an iterative circular process and not a series of, of, of steps that have 
a beginning and then end. <laughs> and all of this um, is linked to then the challenge we were just talking about earlier of monitoring implementation through data that's relevant to these different challenges. Um, a monitoring body should be able to get a sense of what the challenges to implementation will be and hopefully proactively look to look for those challenges and look to see whether or not they're um, creating problems as, the, as things go forward. So it's just a, a quick overview. <laughs> Okay, yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Feli. Uh, yes, I want to ask the participants, please, if you have any question to Dr. Matt or to General Bala or to Dr. Feli, please, you can type in your questions in the chat uh, function. Uh, uh, Dr. Feli, just only to conclude with this one is about you highlight, you have highlighted very well that the uh, sectorial uh, security strategy such as the defense strategy um, are part of the implementation mechanism of the national security strategy. But maybe to build up on what, what uh, Dr. Ann uh, Matt said, how can we make the national security strategy document as a living document and that is adaptive to dynamic reality in an iterative learning process, especially in, line of the, uh, in light of the uh, shock, such as the COVID-19. I think in the toolkit we provide this this cycle of iterative and adaptation and to make the the, uh, the national security strategy as a living document just can you briefly just highlight this the the iterative process and adaptation of the security sec, national security strategy sure so this uh, this really goes back to the point about um the need for monitoring of implementation and a periodic review um you have to be checking in to see if this is working the way that it was intended to work um that's how it becomes a living document if there is no check-in if there is no ability to correct course if there is no a facility for making changes during implementation it's not a living document it's a dead letter that has arrived and and will probably um, be um, moderately successful at best um, so how do you put in place a monitoring or a review system that's going to, to do that job um, the first i've got a few points the first one is it's critical to make it someone's job to do this um, that means that this responsibility has to be clearly defined it has to have a clear set of terms of references and it needs to be handed to somebody who's assigned to do it, who will then be followed up on. Now that may seem very simple, but um, an obvious observation, you might be surprised to learn how many national security strategies actually don't make that step. And therefore, even though there's a sort of a willingness, a need for monitoring that's, that's signaled, it's never actually followed up on. So it's really critical. There's different ways to do it. Often it's an executive agency that will be given this task. It could be a national security council. It could be the office of national security. It could be some, um, a part of the president's office. It could be under the um, head of government if there's a prime minister. It might be a lead ministry in implementation, for example, depending on the context. Um, or it could be a body completely outside the executive. It might be, for example, a drafting committee that becomes a monitoring committee. It might be a parliamentary commission that has a role in this. Um, in Liberia, for example, the national the position of national security advisor was created as a part of the of the um, first national uh, security strategy process, and that and the role of monitoring implementation became part of that role. Um, in uh, the Central African Republic, the national security policy foresaw the creation of, an, an, of a sort of a council of state that would have a very inclusive membership, including civil society with ministers and security force representatives to oversee implementation. So there's a lot of different models. And again, it's going to be very context specific. Um, the next aspect is Whoever is doing this job, they need to have a sufficient mandate. That means they need access to information and at best they can play a coordination role, which means that they can manage sequencing problems which might arise and means that they can also um, manage external support that might be going to supporting this. That's a really important aspect of it. Also, um, powers of dispute resolution are really useful. That means that um, where this mechanism has the um, ability to recognize deadlocks, it's helpful if they can also have some power to break them. This is one reason why executive agencies make a lot of sense in this role, but it doesn't, even if an executive agency has responsibility for monitoring, does not mean that um, it remains an executive task alone. Parliamentary representatives, civil society, media can all be involved in this task. 
Um, technical knowledge is also key. Uh, it's that this is a complicated job and just as in drafting a process required perhaps a certain amount of upskilling, this is also going to be required for monitoring. Um, monitoring and evaluation is a tool, but like any tool, you need to learn how to use it before you can put it to work effectively. And then finally, um, fund the mechanism up front. Any kind of job that has to be done is going to require resources over the long term. And if that is not part of the budget calculation, it probably won't get done. And if it doesn't get done, then this has all been for nothing. <laughs> now, um, I, I will keep it short at that. Um, and perhaps if there's other issues, we can, we can might come out in the question Q&A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Feli. I think, let me thank on your behalf, uh, Dr. Mad, General Bala, and Dr. Feli, they really managed to, to provide us a, a practical way of how to implement the national security strategy and to make it as a living document. 